First-person parkour action games is a fairly scarce group of titles. If you search for them on Steam, you'll find things like Dying Light, Cluster Truck, and the VR game Stride, and a couple other similar games. But for the most part, Mirror's Edge is still considered the face of this little subgenre almost 12 years running now, and for good reason. It boasts excellent movement and mobility, fantastic level design, and a stunning visual aesthetic that merges pristine, sterile cleanliness with eye-popping colors. It's the kind of game that draws a specific crowd, and if you love it, then you really, really love it. However, it also suffered from one glaring weakness. Combat. Mirror's Edge is an action game, yes, but the actual action was best left avoided. While the parkour aspect is amazing, things become clunky as soon as you decided to engage with the enemy, especially through guns. It's at least partly by design, I'm sure, but it still detracted from the overall experience, especially when there's a couple of missions that are actually meant to be combat-focused. Still, it was an experience that was never offered before, and in a lot of aspects the game continues to hold up to this day. However, we now have another noteworthy experience to add to this humble collection of niche, movement-focused first-person experiences, brought to us by the collaborative efforts of One More Level, 3D Realms, and Slipgate Ironworks, publishers 505 Games and All In Games are happy to introduce to us Ghost Runner, a fast-paced, violent, first-person title with a massive focus on parkour-inspired movement and platforming and intense one-hit-kill combat where both the enemies and the player are one mistake away from their demise, all in a grimy, dystopian cyberpunk setting. For those who love first-person parkour action games, Ghost Runner looks like it could be the mirror's edge of the current generation, but this time with combat that's actually enjoyable to participate in, rather than a chore to step around. So does it live up to that expectation? Let's find out. After all, the only thing better than an amazing cyberpunk game is a cyberpunk game that's actually released, right? You play as the titular Ghost Runner, a cybernetic mercenary and one of the deadliest beings ever created. Armed with only a monomolecular katana and a few mobility tools, you travel from the bottom to the top of Dharma Tower, where you seek to confront the Keymaster, a tyrant who attempted, but obviously failed, to kill you. You're a one-man army, constantly outnumbered in every encounter, but still more than capable of cutting your foes down with breakneck speed and awe-striking precision. With the help of the enigmatic voice of a dead man turned into an AI, known as the Architect, and Zoe, a woman who resists the Keymaster's rule, the Ghost Runner sets out on his quest for revenge. The setting of Dharma Tower is a very atmospheric and oppressive one. It's futuristic and reminiscent of 80s-style cyberpunk, which means it's also clearly a shithole, an extremely detailed one. The graphical quality and general aesthetic of Ghost Runner is gorgeous. You might zip through most of the world while platforming or slicing down your foes, but the developers didn't use that as an excuse to skimp out on the visuals. The lighting, the textures, the particle effects, they add a lot of character to the environment. More interesting than Dharma Tower, however, is the Cyber Void, a virtual area that you will be repeatedly visiting mostly as you obtain and practice new abilities. It's an awe-striking digital environment that's loaded with trippy effects and usage of impossible space that frequently shifts and changes around you in real time. It's a really cool area and a much welcome break from the dreary and heavily industrial Dharma Tower. I played the PC version of the game as opposed to the PS4 like I usually do for games I review, and I can't say that I personally ran into many troubles with the game's performance. I had a single freeze mid-mission during my entire playthrough that required a restart of the game, but outside of that, the game kept up a solid frame rate at 1080p and maxed out settings with no trouble. The minimal requirements on the Steam page are actually pretty generous, suggesting that someone who hasn't built or bought a new PC in about 8 years should still be able to play. That said, you'd still be missing out on some excellent visuals. Another contributor to the game's overall feel is the music. Synthwave beats permeate across the entire game, varying in tempo and energy depending on what you're doing or what mission you're in. I don't know if I'd say it's enough of a stellar soundtrack to go out and buy a copy on its own, if it's even available for purchase or streaming at the moment, but it offers its fair share of atmosphere and style to a type of world that is known for its aesthetics. 
Sadly, the intrigue of Ghost Runner's world pretty much stops at its style. The story for the game is paper thin, and the vast majority of lore and backstory is delivered through constant radio chatter from the architect and Zoe. There are lore bits in the form of collectibles scattered throughout the entire game, but they're kinda nothing. If anything, sword skins are far more worth your time to search for. The voice acting from the game's limited cast is alright for the most part, and the game is able to humanize our nameless main character pretty well, all things considered, but there's no real narrative heft here to speak of. Combat in this game has a very straightforward foundation. You see an enemy, you kill them before they kill you. But you both adhere to one same crucial rule. Death in a single hit. It takes only one swing of your badass katana to cut down your foes, but it also takes only one bullet to do the same to you. This is where the twists and turns of Ghost Runner's gameplay come in. Enemy encounters are rarely as simple as just rushing forward full of piss and vinegar hoping to get a hit in. Many fights are essentially small puzzles to figure out on your own. Enemies are scattered throughout an area, and it's up to you to decide in what order you want to deal with them. To do that, you must utilize the game's mobility options. Dashing, sliding, wall running, swinging, and more. It probably goes without saying, but with all of these things in mind, fights are very trial and error. This shouldn't come as a surprise, but enemies get tougher as the game goes on. Some have shields powered by a node you have to destroy sitting somewhere in the room, some are melee enemies that leap at you aggressively, and more. As you progress, getting through a room of enemies without dying becomes less and less likely. But thankfully, it's a fluid and gratifying experience, even if some enemies are more of a chore to deal with as opposed to a thrill. The concept of one-hit-kill combat for both sides probably makes some people reluctant, as they may see it as a big red flag for potential frustration, which is understandable. If you're just not the type who has the patience to redo something dozens, potentially even hundreds of times, especially by design, you might just end up aggravated with Ghost Runner. That said, it's obvious from the get-go that the game is balanced around the idea. Checkpoints are extremely frequent especially during sequences that aren't combat. Oftentimes, if you die due to a platforming blunder, you'll be sent back only about two or three seconds prior, maybe a little bit more. If you die in the middle of a room of enemies, you'll have to restart the whole encounter, sure, but they're rarely longer than a handful of seconds anyway. Furthermore, there's an almost complete absence of a death animation for the Ghost Runner. If you get hit with a bullet or fall to your death, you're just immediately hit with a restart screen and you're sent back to the last checkpoint without having to sit through even an instant of loading time. The game is so focused on speed, it even streamlines your death so you can hop back into the action with very minimal downtime. You can die a hundred times in most missions and still likely not even crack 30 minutes of playtime for them. The entire game being played with only a sword might sound a bit tedious to some but there are several unlockable abilities that will always be there to spice things up a bit, most of which are dedicated to making your deadly character even deadlier. They include Blink, which is the quintessential anime katana move where you dash in a straight line automatically killing every enemy caught in it, and Tempest, which blows away enemies and deflects projectiles back to their sender. It should be noted, however, that it is possible, with good timing, to block bullets without any skills equipped at all. It's pretty satisfying to pull off as you run up to a hapless enemy. Additionally, there's a very unique upgrade system that allows you to pick and choose ways to beef up those unlocked abilities using an obviously Tetris-inspired interface that requires you to fit colorful shapes into a limited amount of spaces. If you want a certain combination of upgrades, you'll need to use your brain to figure out how to fit them into the puzzle. It's a strange but interesting approach to a system we've seen many times before in other action games. I can't remember the last time a developer basically made a minigame out of such a thing. Platforming is a heavy focus for pretty much 100% of the game. Even between fights, you're navigating through increasingly complex and kinetic spaces where you're desperately trying to go from point A to point B without falling into a pit or getting electrocuted. This is a game where you just don't stop moving. Considering all the mobility and offensive mechanics the game asks you to keep in mind and use as much as you can on the fly against enemies that are very, very active in trying to kill you, 
it can be a tough experience. But when the game's at its best, it feels buttery smooth, immensely satisfying, and above all else, really fucking cool. Some missions are so streamlined that they really benefit themselves towards speedrunning, and retrying them to get your time down can be really fun. However, that's not to say that Ghost Runner is completely perfect in this aspect. As fun as it is, it comes with one glaring disappointment. Spots of unreliable platforming in spite of so much focus on it. Now don't get me wrong, it's still a functional experience overall, but there are some quirks to the mobility options that might make certain moments turn frustrating. Most of the issues I personally came across involve wall running. In a lot of instances, you'll be performing a wall run on a vertical metal platform that's conveniently placed and turned in a way that directs you to progress. Oftentimes there will be two or three in a row. A fairly bothersome thing is how the game magnetizes you, so to speak, to these walls when you're trying to perform a wall run. Or rather, how it fails to magnetize you sometimes. If you overshoot your jump just a tiny bit going from one to the other, the Ghost Runner will actually stop wall running and instead attempt to climb onto the floating wall as if it were a normal horizontal platform. If you're unable to hit a wall at enough of a parallel angle, you'll just end up smashing your face against it and falling, even if you didn't hit it at a 90 degree angle and had a fair amount of momentum behind you. When transferring from one wall to another, you might fall off of the wall you're on because you've reached the end of it, even though it seems like you should have one more step. On rare occasions, you may hit a wall seemingly perfectly and still stop dead in your tracks and just fall to your death. It's a damn shame that a game with so much parkour-inspired traversal and mobility options has platforming as its biggest weakness. I expect more people to probably be more frustrated with this instead of combat. Outside of the combat and platforming sequences, there are spots of puzzles that you'll have to solve in order to progress, usually in the Cyber Void. They're fairly straightforward and not much to write home about. I personally didn't find them all that inhibiting to the experience, save for maybe one of them which involves spinning obstacle courses that can absolutely fuck off, but I can definitely understand some people disliking their uninspired implementation when just a bit more fighting and wall running would have sufficed in their place. Finally, there's the discussion of game length. According to my recorded playtime on Steam, I finished the game in just four and a half hours, thanks largely in part to the practice I had with the demo, I'm sure, but still, I racked about between 400 to 500 deaths across the entire game. Granted, this is probably going to be a bit faster than average, as I've already seen lots of people record hundreds of deaths in some single missions, so my four and a half hours may end up being six to eight hours for others. Or, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you might take to this game far faster than I did and finish it in just over three. If you're already into trial and error games with similar speed and stakes, you probably already guessed this would be the case. Obviously, this is a game designed with replayability in mind, supported by the fact that it has leaderboards for both mission completion time and total deaths. But, to people who tend to play a game only once, maybe twice if they love it, this length could be seen as a highway robbery even for $30. Personally, I don't feel that way. I enjoyed the Ghost Runner experience enough to have replayed certain missions several times, specifically ones with fights that I actually look forward to, so I definitely do feel like I got my money's worth in terms of content. However, the game is still short enough for this to be a major point worth bringing up. There aren't any extra modes to speak of, and the aforementioned leaderboards are only among friends, not global. This game has pretty much the entirety of its experience dependent on how much you enjoy just controlling the Ghost Runner. A lot of enemy encounters can be challenging, yes, but one crack in the game's armor is the fact that a fair few are fun to actively engage in. I enjoy the general act of cutting my enemies down, zipping around, and clearing out a room, but on replays of missions, it was very rare of me to look forward to the actual participation of specific fights. This is probably a side effect of the game's combined speed and one-hit kill rule as it basically makes a meaningful or entertaining back-and-forth interaction with enemies unlikely. My investment basically hinged on the fact that movement and killing things just feels nice, as opposed to the battle itself being fun. 
With everything dying in one hit, a single enemy can be an impassable brick wall up until the instant they turn into paper. This isn't a big deal so long as you simply enjoy the feeling of being the Ghost Runner, as I said, but when I look back at my time with the game, I tend to recall whole missions, as opposed to specific fights within, because most aren't all that memorable to begin with. Overall, Ghost Runner is a solid game that's pretty honest about its nature. A gameplay-focused, trial-and-error experience. However, it's this nature that will end up being pretty divisive. I can see most people liking or even loving the game for the most part, but some people outright hating it, and probably for understandable reasons. The platforming and traversal is a huge part of the game, and while it's mostly functional, it's not quite as reliable as you would hope. The combat is fun, but there are very few encounters worth note outside of them just being difficult. The setting and environments are gorgeous, but the story is barely engrossing or even existent outside of the constant delivery of exposition from two supporting characters. And there's a noticeable lack of modes to help bolster the playtime of this game that can be finished in as little as four hours. As a new IP in a niche subgenre of action that struggles to maintain relevancy, Ghost Runner is great and could serve as a sturdy foundation for developers one more level to build on. If they decide to make a Ghost Runner 2 and can iron out the issues, it could be an absolutely fantastic game without the asterisk of being divisive. I look forward to seeing where this franchise goes from here. This concludes my review of Ghost Runner. It's a bit of a love it or hate it game, but if you like what you saw or heard in this video, give it a shot. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.